series. Thanks for joining us here on YouTube and on Facebook today for another exciting edition of our program. I'm your host, Chris Smith, and I work here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. As always, it's good to be with you for our exciting lecture series. We meet really interesting people doing interesting stuff all across the state of North Carolina, sometimes even beyond. Today is no different. Now, this program is organized, coordinated by the folks at the North Carolina Office of Environmental Education within the Department of Environmental Quality, and it's a broadcast service of us here at the Museum of Natural Sciences, working together to bring you some great science, nature, art, and education content live into your feeds every single week. Make sure that you mark your calendars every Wednesday at noon, or at least most Wednesdays at noon. We're right here bringing you great people who really are doing stuff that's like at the cutting edge of science or technology or nature or environmental education. We talk about some really exciting stuff. Uh, and like I said, today's no different because we're gonna be talking about something that I think most of us are at least a little bit familiar with. And that in my experience working here at the Natural History Museum, um, everybody enjoys learning more about. And fortunately, we've got a great panel of experts who are going to share with us uh, some new research and some new projects and ways that we can all get involved in the science. So let me jump into it. The first person that we're going to meet today is Chris Goforth. Chris is the head of citizen science here at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences. Hey, Chris. Hey, everyone. Next up will be Dr. Clyde Sorensen. Dr. Sorensen is a professor of entomology at North Carolina State University. Hey, Clyde. How y'all doing? And then today, bringing it home will be Jerry Reynolds. And Jerry is the head of outreach here at the Museum of Natural Sciences. Good to be with you, Jerry. Thanks so much, Chris. Glad to have everybody join us today. So I'm very excited to learn about this Carolina ghost hunt, uh, and particularly why the Museum of Natural Sciences is involved in ghost hunts. But uh, Chris, I guess I'll hand it over to you. All right. Well, um, if you're unaware, um, the ghosts are a type of firefly. And so I'm going to kick things off with um, some intro information about fireflies. So kind of basic introduction to this group of insects. So let me share my screen here really quickly. All right. I'm assuming we can see that. Okay. Looks All right. Great. All right. Um, so fireflies are very, very popular insects. You've probably seen them if you live in North Carolina. Um, I grew up in a part of the country that didn't have these animals. And so they've always been terribly exciting to me um, because they are amazing, or at least ones that light up. Uh, so let's meet the fireflies. Um, I feel like probably most of you know this already, but it's good just to bring these home, um, you know, kind of ground these where they're, they're situated in the animals. So fireflies are insects. Um, they are animals with, you know, three body parts, uh, six legs, two antennae, wings. They are also beetles. So within the insects, they fall in the beetle order, uh, which means that they've got uh, kind of specialized upper wings. And we'll talk about that here in just a moment. Uh, and they are members of the family Lampyridae, which are the uh, the beetles that light up. Um, so they're the ones with the lamps. Uh, so it's easier to remember their group. So the, most fireflies have some kind of characteristics that they share that puts them into that family together. Uh, one, they are pretty soft bodied. Um, and so if you think about beetles, you, know, you usually think of these pretty hard animals. Um, fireflies are a lot more flexible, a lot softer than a lot of other beetles, but they still have those modified upper wings. Um, these are called um, elytra. They are um, hardened upper wings that kind of protect the flight wings underneath. Um, but even these hardened upper wings are fairly soft in the, the fireflies compared to other beetles. They do tend to have their heads tucked under their thorax. Uh, so this section here is called the pronotum. It's the front uh, plate, upper plate of the, the thorax. Uh, and the heads tend to be kind of tucked down underneath uh, rather than sticking out the front like they um, do in a lot of other beetles. They do tend to have five toes on each foot. 
and many of them do have light producing organs. Now, not all fireflies actually light up. Uh, there are some that are considered dark species that don't have any sort of light producing organs. Uh, so the part of the country I'm from, the southwestern US, we have fireflies. There are lots of firefly species, but they didn't light up. So you could see these animals, but not the light, the light show that you get from the ones here in North Carolina and other parts of the country and other parts of the world. So just like really quick comparison, there's a firefly on the left. Um, and here's another similar beetle, uh, a soldier beetle. You can tell these two apart really pretty quickly by looking at the head, the position of the head. The soldier beetles also tend to be fairly soft body and about the same shape, um, look very similar, but their heads are really protruding from the, the thorax rather than being kind of tucked down underneath. So there are a lot of firefly species, um, you know, insects always have a whole lot of species uh, in any particular group. So there's about 2200 species and about 110 genera of fireflies worldwide. Uh, so it's a fairly good number of species. Uh, in the US, we've got about 170 species in about 10 genera. Um, but there are probably still many that we don't know and you'll hear about a group that is very poorly understood today. Uh, and in North Carolina, from all the sources that I've been able to look at, including NC State's insect collection, uh, bug guide, other sources of information, it looks like there's about eight genera in North Carolina, and the number of species is really pretty uncertain in our state. Um, we could have lots, we might only have a few. Um, they're still just really poorly understood in a lot of groups in our, our state. So, the fireflies are really well known for their lamps, their, their light organ, um, and this is a biochemical process. So they've got kind of a structure on the underside of their, their thorax that they use to produce the light. Um, you, know, you can see it there, this kind of thinner area where the light shines through their exoskeleton, but the actual light itself is a chemical reaction. So they um, basically mix a chemical together with some energy and an enzyme to produce light. Uh, and this is a really efficient chemical process. So a lot of times when you get light, you also get heat. Uh, with fireflies, you tend to get pretty much only light, not a lot of heat. This is a really, really efficient chemical reaction. Um, but basically you're mixing luciferin with luciferase and some energy, and then you get light coming out the other end. Um, so that's really what these animals are best known for. They light up for a lot of different reasons. Um, one really important one is that these animals are crepuscular or nocturnal, so they are active either at dusk or at night. Uh, and so one of the things that they really need this light for is to communicate with each other. If you're an animal that's really active in the dark, you need to be able to find other individuals of your species. Uh, a lot of nocturnal animals do that through pheromones, and so they're sending chemical cues out into the environment. Uh, fireflies are lighting up, and so they're flashing lights at each other to be able to talk to each other and find each other. They are also thought to advertise some um, palatability. Um, these have some pretty nasty chemicals in them that a lot of other animals don't really want to eat. Uh, and so if you're an animal, an insect, and you're a really big prey species for a lot of other animals, and you're lighting up and telling everything where you are in the dark, um, it's good if you have some other protection. So these animals look like they do have some chemicals that make them not so great to eat. Uh, and so the light can also advertise that maybe you should stay away from these animals. And then there are a few in, few fireflies that are cheaters. So I'll talk about one of those at the, the end of my little section here. So the way this works for most species that light up uh, you get this kind of call and response kind of thing where you have the males flying around lighting their light organ as they fly. And so the exact timing and the, the pattern that they use varies from species to species so that they can tell each other apart uh, their species from others. But the males are flying around lighting their light organs, following their pattern, looking for females. And for the most part, the females are kind of sitting on vegetation, fairly still in one place, they will look for the male call, the light signal, and then they'll flash their own response call. And so you get this call and response between the males and the females. And then different species have different 
patterns of light, colors of light. So the colors, the patterns, the um, length of time they stay lit, all these different things can tell you a little bit about which species you're looking at. So these are three species that are really fairly well known in North Carolina. Um, the blue ghost you'll hear about a little bit later with uh, Clyde's section. Um, they tend to light their light organ and leave it lit as they fly. Uh, Futuris tends to have this kind of flash bulb kind of effect or they look like Christmas lights. Um, sometimes people call them the paparazzi firefly. So lots of different names for this kind of flash pattern that they have. Um, the big dipper, also called the, the J flash firefly, uh, the males light their light organ, then they'll dip downwards and then fly up as they fly. So you get this kind of J-shaped flash pattern. Uh, and this um, Fotanus paralis is really, really common in North Carolina. It's probably the one that you're going to see in your yard most often. Um, so it's one that you can look out for that kind of J-shaped pattern. All right, and then the last thing I want to share are the cheaters. Um, there are some fireflies uh, in the genus Fraturus that have figured out a way to um, attract prey with their light. So they are actually feeding on other firefly species. And so they will sit in uh, vegetation, watch for the male call of other species, and then give the female response call for that species that they want to prey on. And so they are luring in the males of other species uh, and then will um, attack and eat them when they come near. So they're considered a cheating species. Um, they do also light up their own light pattern to find mates, but they're using the light um, communication of other species to lure and prey as well, which is a really pretty cool behavior um, that some of these, these fireflies do. All right, that is all I have. And so I'm gonna pass it over to Clyde, who's going to tell you a lot more about the ghost fireflies in particular, which are amazing, amazing fireflies. All right, so um, let me get my screen set up properly here. And we'll go ahead and talk about one particular group of uh, fireflies that we're really interested in y'all knowing about you know, because we need to know a whole lot more about them ourselves. And this is the uh, group of fireflies that we call ghost fireflies. These are uh, really cool little, um, actually little, little uh, hedging. They're tiny fireflies that have some really interesting behaviors. So let's go ahead and um, introduce you um, to this really cool little group of fireflies. Um, before I do that, though, I, I want to kind of refresh your um, memory of, of, about the parts of, of fireflies because I'm going to be using some of these uh, terms to help um, give you some insight into the species that we're interested in looking at. And so when we look at a firefly, some uh, parts of the firefly's body that are really important in helping us sort out who is who, which species is which, would include the antennae. Um, the antennae uh, can have variable numbers of segments. They can have some odd segments on them. In some species of fireflies, the antenna segments are individually uh, kind of weird in shape, so the antennae can be very useful. Um, the compound eyes of fireflies are really distinct, and what you'll notice in most species is that the males have huge compound eyes, um, the females often uh, smaller uh, compound eyes. Uh, Chris mentioned the pronotum. The pronotum is the top plate on the first thoracic segment on a firefly. And for us, it's really important because the shape and the color and the marking pattern on the pronotum uh, often is really important in helping us distinguish one firefly from another. Behind the pronotum is the scutellum, which is the top plate on the middle thoracic segment. And the color and shape of that scutellum can also be useful when we're trying to identify a species of firefly. And then there are the uh, elytra, and the singular is elytron. And these are those weird, um, um, useful, highly protective uh, four wings that Chris mentioned earlier. In fireflies, the shape of the elytra um, the uh, color uh, pattern on the elytra, and sometimes actually the texture or sculpturing 
of the elytra can have a big impact on uh, helping us sort out who's who. And then finally, in some fireflies, not necessarily the group that we're going to be talking about today, there's this uh, additional characteristic called an elytral fold, um, which can help us, again, identify different uh, species of fireflies. All right, so let's talk about the, the stars of the, of the show today, and that's the genus Phalsus. So these are the ghost fireflies. Um, there are at least 10 species of these little tiny sprites uh, in North America. And I say at least because we're certain there are many species, uh, maybe, who knows, uh, several more species that have yet to be identified. Um, most of these species are really, really small. Uh, the males, which are the ones you're most likely to encounter um, in uh, at least some of them are uh, average less than a quarter of an inch. In all these species, the females are wingless and they look more like a larva than they do an adult beetle. Uh, and in all the species, the females have uh, tiny light organs. The number of light organs and their distribution on the uh, body of that insect can help us identify one from another as well. Of the 10 species of, uh, that we know of so far, most of them are what we would call dark fireflies. So they have males that don't have light organs. And in these species, the, the dark males simply fly around looking for the lights produced by uh, the females of their species. Um, probably the most familiar of these uh, ghost fireflies in this genus um, is the blue ghost, uh, which has kind of become somewhat uh, famous, much in the, in the way that the, the synchronous fireflies up in the mountains have, because in, under the right conditions, they can produce a pretty spectacular show. We'll talk more about blue ghosts in just a second. In general, um, this is kind of the, what we uh, understand to be the general life cycle of ghost fireflies. Um, in most of the species, it looks like the the females will emerge from ground burrows after they finish pupating, they molt to the adult stage. Um, they come to the surface of the uh, soil um, and um, uh, they'll uh, advertise their presence by turning on their lights. At the right time of night, during the right couple of weeks uh, in the year. The males will be flying around above uh, the forest floor or the soil, um, looking for those females. Most of the males fly probably between one and four feet above the forest floor. If they see a female, they just drop out of the air, basically, and uh, try and land within a couple inches of where that female is, and then they'll run over and try and convince her that they're actually a suitable candidate for mating. And if uh, everything goes right, they mate. Sometimes we see, especially with blue ghosts, there may be many males competing for a single female, and you may end up with a ball of uh, males all scrambling to try and gain access to a single female, which is kind of remarkable. After they mate, and in some species, the females may mate more than one time, um, the female will eventually lay a cohort of eggs, a single batch of eggs that might have somewhere between 20 and 40 eggs in it. And then she'll guard those eggs for um, days or maybe a couple weeks until she dies. She doesn't eat anything um, while she's guarding those eggs and eventually she starves to death. And then those eggs hatch sometime uh, a little later and the predaceous larvae feed on soil invertebrates. And for most of these species, we really don't know exactly what it is they do feed on. We know they're predaceous, but we don't know what they prey on, um, and they'll feed uh, throughout the re remaining part of the warm, uh, warm part of the year. And then um, they'll pupate at some point between the fall and the spring and the cycle starts over again. But these are very poorly known species. We don't have um, a great deal of insight in into the specifics of the life cycle for most of them. All right, so 
second here. Maybe I moved something out of my way. Let's go ahead and talk about uh, some of the individual species, and we'll talk first about the uh, Falsus reticulata. This is the blue ghost of the mountains of North Carolina and other states. This is the one that is most well known. Um, I'm going to show you some pictures, um, and I want you to uh, pay some particular attention to particular characteristics of these. Um, the blue ghost primarily flies in um, May and sometimes into June. We may have some activity uh, as early as um, late April, uh, depending on elevation. Um, this is the one that uh, you can see at places like DuPont State Forest in numbers that can exceed hundreds and hundreds um, within a single field of view. Um, the blue ghost, uh, char characteristics that uh, can help you identify a blue ghost if you have one in your hand um, would include the shape. See how round this uh, pronotum is, the shape of the pronotum. Also notice that there's a dark um, maculation or uh, patch here in the middle of the pronotum with a couple small clear uh, windows so it can see above it while it's flying uh, as well as below. Uh, it gets the name reticulata from this patterning on the elytra and you'll notice that the elytra have all these little ridges and, and um, um, valleys in them and that's where the name reticulata comes from. Um, so uh, reticulata, again, um, is kind of uh, famous for having these large displays in the mountains. Um, this uh, picture on the left is a, uh, a really interesting image that Lynn Faust, who's a, a pretty notable uh, firefly expert, took showing um, a male and female reticulata mate mating. Notice that the male is considerably smaller than the female. Unlike a lot of fireflies, uh, Falsus fireflies don't mate for a real long time. They uh, mate within a, a matter of 10 or 15 minutes. Some other fireflies stay paired up for hours. Um, and we could talk about that at some other time. Now, they're called blue ghosts, but their light's not actually blue. If you have one in hand, or if you see one up close, you'll notice that the light is actually kind of a a blue green, but we call them blue ghosts because of a weird um, optical illusion called the Perdinky effect. I think I said that more or less right. And basically what this is, is that if you're looking at a, a, a faint green light at any distance, it shifts um, uh, to, towards the blue side of the spectrum because of the way our eyes work. So um, blue ghosts aren't really blue, they're green, but blues, we'll stick with blue ghost. All right. So that's the one that is most well known. Of uh, the 10 species uh, of identified falsus, the blue ghost and only two others um, uh, of recognized species are known to glow. Um, but we think there are more. All right, um, this is the known distribution of reticulata in North Carolina. Notice that it's all concentrated in the mountains of North Carolina. Um, I know I've observed them myself at Stone Mountain uh, State Park, and I've observed them in several other places uh, uh, along this spine. We don't have a real good understanding of how far east they extend in North Carolina. And that becomes a real interesting question to us because um, we do have this other thing I'm going to talk to you about in a minute, and we uh, it, it'd be really wonderful to be able to figure out where uh, there is uh, any overlap, if there is any overlap between the blue ghost and the new thing that we're talking about here in a minute. Another species that occurs in North Carolina, but is very poorly known is Falsus. Inexensa, and inexensa, by the way, means doesn't light. And this is a, a species that is known as the shadow ghost uh, by a common name. This is one of the dark species. So the males have no light organs. Um, the females have two light spots at the tip of their abdomen. 
Um, and we're pretty certain, um, again, we don't know very much about this species in North Carolina or really anywhere else, um, but we do think that it flies earlier than the blue ghost, the females call earlier than the blue ghost. And we suspect that it's widely distributed in North Carolina. But again, we have very little information on this insect. So um, we don't know for a fact uh, exactly where uh, Faustus inexensa is distributed because we have uh, a great deal of difficulty actually collecting this insect. The males, again, have no lights, so you can't see them after dark when they're flying around. Um, we can find the females, um, uh, and that's something that we're probably interested in having people help us with, um, but we, we need to learn a lot more about this insect. All right, so uh, I've talked about two known species of Faustus in North Carolina. Um, now I'm gonna talk about some uh, undescribed species of Faustus in the Carolinas. And before I talk about our critter that we're dealing with here in North Carolina, I wanna introduce you to a situation that's occurring in our neighboring state in South Carolina. Um, and so if you look at this map, and this map was uh, prepared by Lynn Faust again, you'll see uh, in the upstate um, some red stars. Those red stars are indicating the known distribution of the blue ghost, reticulata in South Carolina. And then down east, um, actually uh, uh, in the uh, upper coastal plain of South Carolina, um, some workers have discovered another species of glowing phalsus that's not the blue ghost, but hasn't been described. They're calling it the low country ghost. And it has in, uh, as far as I can determine, uh, a great deal in common with the critter that we're interested in finding more out about, and that's our Piedmont ghost. All right, so, this is another undescribed species, one that we have um, been finding here in North Carolina. And so um, I wanna show you some pictures of this undescribed critter that we're calling the Piedmont ghost for the time being. And then I'll show you some pictures that compare it to reticulata so you can see the differences. Um, so this is our a male of our undescribed Piedmont ghost. Notice that the pronotum is differently shaped on this individual than it was on the um, blue ghost. I'll show you side by side in just a second so you can see that more clearly. Um, also notice that the windows in its pronotum are much larger and there's no dark marking in the middle. Also notice that the elytra are shaped a little bit differently and that they have much less of that ridging and valley, valleying of that reticulation that we saw in um, the blue ghost. So this is the dorsal side of a, a view of a male uh, Piedmont ghost. This is the underside of a male Piedmont ghost. These are the light organs of our undescribed species. Also notice they have huge eyes, and one other thing that you ought to notice when I show you the bottoms of these uh, insects is they don't have functional mouth parts. They don't eat as adults. All right, so notice the size of those light organs there. These two images are showing you uh, our Piedmont ghost up here and reticulata, the blue ghost down here. So you can see side by side the differences. Notice the difference in the shape of the pronotum the difference in the markings on the pronotum, the difference in the size of those windows in the pronotum. So on the Piedmont ghost, you can basically see the entire top of their eyes. That's not the case on the blue ghost. Uh, probably a little bit more striking is when you look at the underside of, I'm sorry, of the um, beetles. You'll notice that on uh, the uh, Piedmont ghost, again, look at that wild pronotum, uh, the light organs are smaller. And what that means in practice is, is that the 
the Piedmont ghosts are dimmer when you see them in the woods than the uh, blue ghosts are. And that does have an impact on how easy they are um, to find. So um, before we move on to the distribution uh, of these uh, critters and what we know so far about them, um, let me show you what the females look like. This is a female Piedmont ghost. Um, this is its head, her head and her legs. This is the tip of her abdomen and she has two light organs right about here, one here and one here. That's uh, pretty much what the back or the uh, belly looks like rather. This is what she looks like from the side. Okay. Uh, Jerry's gonna tell you a little bit more about our discovery of this uh, really cool little critter and what we'd like you to help us with. But let me go ahead and give you a, a little insight into what we do know so far about the distribution of this insect. The first population of um, Piedmont ghosts that we came to identify was right here in Chatham County. And we, uh, I first observed this in, in uh, 20, um, 20. Since then, last year, we were able to identify populations in other parts of Chatham County, population in Wake County, uh, populations in Johnston County, and we had uh, a report Port of population in Montgomery County. Really interestingly, just this morning, I got an email uh, from a, a lady in uh, Montgomery County who has conclusively established that our Piedmont ghosts are in Montgomery County as well. So if they're there and they're here, they're probably all, all through here as well. But we don't know how much further north they extend, how much further east they extend, uh, how much further west they extend. So we need to learn a lot more about them. With that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jerry and we can continue uh, trying to figure out what these cool little fireflies are. All right, well, great, uh, Chris and Clyde. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot, a lot that we need to learn about this really cool group of fireflies. And this is where you come in and can give us some help. Okay, does that show up everybody? All right, very good. Well, we're inviting you to join us on the Carolina ghost hunt uh, so that you can help us uh, learn more about this firefly because we can only be in one place at one time and there's a lot of ground to cover. So. I'm gonna to talk to you about hunting ghosts and uh, give you some information on how you can go out and help us map out uh, where this Piedmont ghost occurs. And of course we wanna know where, when, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and we're gonna tell you how to look for them and also how to document and report what you do find. Now, the where is uh, pretty, uh, pretty widespread. Uh, even though we're focusing on the central part of North Carolina, as Clyde mentioned, you know, they are elsewhere and we need to determine that. I mean, thus far, you know, except for the Montgomery populations, we only knew of them in a, a small three county area. So we want to, and we don't have any clue how far of East they go, how far west, north, and so on, as Clyde mentioned, and South Carolina. You know, this same critter may be in counties of South Carolina. So, uh, you know, the, the fireflies don't know the political boundaries that we artificially put on the terrain that they're living in. So, so please don't, uh, don't do look for them in South Carolina if you have access to areas. Now, uh, looking at and what Clyde just sort of gave you, I'm going to summarize, you know, the, Last year, this time, you know, we only knew of one that one population that Clyde mentioned in Chatham County. We now know that there are more populations in Chatham County, and then this one in Wake County too. An interesting thing about the Wake County one is that even though scientists really didn't know about this Wake County site until recently, uh, 
John Connors, he knew about this population of ghost fireflies 40 years ago. He was leading, he was working for Raleigh Parks uh, system and he was leading night hikes for kids. And he was enjoying seeing these ghost fireflies in early spring on his night hikes. Uh, he, he didn't know what they were. He called them little phantom fireflies. And uh, he just sort of assumed that, well, entomologists surely know they're here. So he didn't really make a big deal about it. So, so, so once he saw some of uh, Clyde's postings about this ghost firefly, he said, well, that sort of rings a bell. Uh, and he got Clyde out there and confirmed that, yeah, these are the Piedmont ghosts that we've been looking for. So, so technically, uh, John Connors officially documented and observed in his mind this ghost firefly in Wake County 40 years ago. So, so anyway, that's a, that's a neat part of the story. And they're still there, <laughs> which is really cool. Now, we now know that they're in Johnson County too. And, uh, and I want to tell you the story about the Johnson County fireflies. So this is going to be the Johnson County ghost story. And I'm in Johnson County right now. Um, in fact, this, I'm in my home studio otherwise known as the bonus room above my garage in my home in Johnson County. And let me tell you a ghost story. Now, it all starts one dark night as most ghost stories do. And it actually starts with Clyde last year. Uh, in April of last year, you know, Clyde knew about that population in Chatham County. He, he, he put the word out on Facebook, of help us find the Piedmont ghost. You know, he talks about the blue ghost fireflies, and then he mentions about that one known population in Chatham County, and, and surely they must be elsewhere. So he put the word out for people to look for this you know, ghost firefly where, wherever they were and gave some guidance in terms of how to do that. Well, about a month later, May 1st of last year, he announced success. You know, fellow Piedmont ghost hunters, we've had success. At least four more sites in, in two counties, Wake and Chatham County, and Again, encouraging people to get out and look for these. And, and I saw this post and, you know, I've been following this story, obviously work, working some with Clyde. And I said, that's awesome. Uh, do you think that they may occur in our part of Johnson County? And I said our part because Clyde and I both live in Johnson County, only about a mile apart. And uh, Clyde responded, well, it's worth looking. So I thought, wow, that's great. Yeah, it certainly would be worth looking. Well. About a week later, I, I was, I had supper, uh, sitting in my lazy boy recliner or whatever recliner is at home, watching something probably on Netflix. And Clyde re put an additional post on there aimed at me, any luck. You've know, been, been about a week since he said it's worth looking. And so he's now asking us any luck. And there I am sitting comfortably in my chair, probably having a second beer after supper. And, uh, I responded to Clyde, well, you would know if I did. And that was a carefully worded statement because I didn't lie, but I really didn't tell the whole truth. And the whole truth was that I really hadn't bothered to go look. Yes, yeah, it's worth looking, but I really hadn't bothered to go look. Yeah, I mean, I mean, from my recliner, I could see the backyard. Yeah, no, I don't see any ghost fireflies out there. Uh, but I really felt bad about that response. I didn't, again, I didn't lie. <laughs> I just didn't fully divulge the truth that I hadn't looked. So it was about the right time of evening. Uh, so I said, what the heck? Uh, let me go grab a red light. Let me go out there, you know, check the, the woods behind my house just to prove that they're not there. So I wouldn't feel bad about my response to Clyde. So that's what I did. I, you know, I, I got my gear, uh, trudged through the back, backyard, back fence, crossed a small stream and started trudging up the hill. Yeah, you know, again, just to get up there so I had a good view to, again, so that I wouldn't see anything there and, again, would feel good about my response. Well, as I was trudging up the hill, I thought I saw something. I thought I saw a dim blue light. And really? How many beers did I have with supper? But then I, I hadn't really looked up the hill a little bit because I was just watching my, my, my footing there. And when I looked up the hill, I could see all these faint little blue lights sort of dancing, wavering over the ground. I had 
the Piedmont ghost fireflies behind my house in Johnson County. I could not believe it. Uh, if I didn't have that guilt complex, I may have not ever gone out there to look for them, really. I just could not believe it. And I was so excited. I, I posted that evening on Facebook, got them. Yeah, and I, I, think I, ended, I think Clyde and I later ended up talking by phone about these ghost fireflies. So excited, first uh, documentation in Johnson County. So I'm really, really close to Wake County, but still, this was really cool. So you know, Clyde and I laugh about this. I laugh at myself about this, that I just assumed they weren't there and didn't go out and look. But we also laugh about Clyde, okay? Clyde was going to Chatham County and Wake County, and I think maybe Orange County, you know, driving from near where I am looking for these fireflies, and he hadn't looked in his woods. After my report, he went and he's got these ghost fireflies in his woods behind his house too. So, so those are the populations we know of, of, of this firefly, and we get a laugh about that. And the reason why I tell the story is that do not assume that they're not behind your house or near your house. We don't know. Don't assume anything. Unless you go out and look uh, for them, we will not know. So that's why we really need your help. Uh, this is the first firefly, blue ghost male firefly that, that I caught. And this one was actually caught in a web. And actually that night, I grabbed that thing in a web. Uh, it, was light, it was still lighting up in the web. I wanted to make sure I had physical proof that I really saw these. It wasn't just lying to Clyde about the appearance of these fireflies. So, so this one ended up being a voucher specimen uh, from that population. And I went later and collected one female as a voucher specimen. And you can see these things are tiny, a quarter of an inch size of a grain of rice. They're really tiny. Uh, but anyway, it's so cool that that they're you're right, right back there. And again, uh, the, you can see the two light spots. You know, if you do get to see females, you, you take a, a lens and make sure you get down to, because that is a, a good characteristic to, to nail down uh, the female of this uh, firefly. Uh, now this is uh, where I live in Johnson County. My house is right there. And you can see I have this uh, patch of woods behind the house uh, there. And it is mixed woods, so hardwoods. Uh, with pine trees. You can see the pine trees are green when this image was taken. And this is where they were. This is 600 feet that direction from where I am right now is where this population of uh, ghost fireflies occurs. And so uh, this is showing the terrain where it is, they're, they're more up higher as opposed to down along the stream, as you might, some people expect fireflies to be. Uh, this is a drone video from a recent snowstorm. So again, you can see this is what you, this is what where we think they occur, mixed woods with some pine trees. And certainly in this part of Johnston County, the pine trees here originally were probably longleaf pines. Uh, now they're mostly uh, loblolly with some native shortleaf uh, in there too. This is what it looks like from the ground. Again, nothing remarkable, remarkable about the woods except they're still there in Johnston County where we're losing a lot of this these forests, even, even the, the young forests, but you can see a mixture of hardwoods and pine trees. This is, this is the spot right here. Uh, and all I had to do is go through my back gate <laughs> to get to it. Uh, and I've been living in this house for almost 20 years and I, and I've discovered a lot of neat plants and animals back there. Never knew I had such a special inhabitant back there as these ghost fireflies. So, so now I know. <laughs> uh, and the Durant Park, uh, if you look at where, where John Connors uh, first observed these and enjoyed seeing them every spring with his night hikes, you can see the, the uh, again, mixed woods. You've got hardwoods and pines mixed in there. This is the nature trail. This is the very nature trail that John took the kids on on his night hikes to enjoy seeing the little phantom fireflies as they called them back in those days. Uh, again, a mixture of hardwoods, pine trees, good leaf litter, uh, which we think is pretty important for the, uh, where the females are, are living uh, and where they raise their, you know, where they raise themselves up for. Anyway, so this habitat is probably all across middle and other parts of North Carolina. So that sort of gives you a clue of, of where to look. And you can go on Google Earth and look at 
satellite views of to help map out where you want to look. And if you do go on Google Earth and it shows up where everything is green, like a summer photo, uh, go back in time, which you can do on Google Earth, and go back to a winter shot. And with the winter shot, you can see what are hardwoods and what are pine trees. And that gives you a better search image of where to look. And this is Lake Johnson Park. And I know that uh, Raleigh City Park staff are going to be looking in Lake Johnson Park if they haven't already, along with some other parks. Uh, and again, look in your area where you might be and look for a similar habitat uh, and, go, and go look. Now, as far as the wind, we've always said that, you know, they're, they're their mating periods of maybe two or three weeks, sometime between mid-April and mid-May. Uh, this year, uh, John Connor saw the first female of April 21st uh, in Durant Park. Uh, and so I just randomly picked May 21st as, you know, somewhere in that time frame is when we should be looking. Today is May 4th. All right, we're right in the middle. You were right in the peak of the time. As a matter of fact, I saw my first male of ghost firefly behind my house on Monday night. And I went out last night and I had about eight or 10 males flying, in addition to the females who had been glowing actually previous nights too. So now's the time to go out. So, so please, what, what are you doing tonight? You know, if the weather clock breaks, please go out tonight. And if you do so, May the 4th be with you when you do go out. Now, as far as what time to go out, because that's equally important, uh, right after sunset. Uh, about 45 minutes after legal sunset is when it gets almost totally dark, and that's key because they start almost as soon as it gets totally dark. So again, roughly about 45 minutes after legal sunset, uh, we think that when temperatures are above 60 degrees, uh, is best. Uh, cool evenings last year, I didn't see anything when it was really cool at night, uh, but once it warmed up, had warmer nights, then we did see some activity. Now, uh, when you do go out, you only need to watch for about 30 to 60 minutes, because again, there's a short window, you know, both date-wise and a short window time-wise within the evening, when they're active because you know you don't need to be out there for several hours because if, if you don't see them in the first 60 minutes they're probably not there or they're not doing their thing that night so again back to may 4th sunset tonight in the raleigh area is 803 45 minutes after sunset will be 848 a little early so i would probably go out about 8 30 just so i can where i can see and get myself where i want to be uh, and last night I went out at 8.40, and sure enough, about 8.50, uh, you know, well, the females were actually lit up when I first got out there, but I saw the first male at about 8.50 last night. And uh, you want to watch for, again, 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, you don't probably don't need to watch any longer than that. Last night, uh, males were, I was only watching males for about 20 minutes after that first one that I saw. So, again, it's a limited flight time. And even though the females, the females actually, stay lit longer. So they're actually more detectable for a longer time period. So there were still some females of glowing even after the males appeared to have stopped flying from what I could see. So, so, so anyway, this will give you some guidance uh, when to go out and just sort of apply this general rule to when you do go out. And I think you have a great chance of success. Now, how? <laughs> well, you just go out and look. <laughs> Uh, there's nothing else that's going to be glowing. They're not real bright, but the, there's nothing else that's going to be glowing. The, again, the females, they're easy to see in the litter once you get a view of them. And the males, the males are a little more fleeting. Uh, matter of fact, if you stare at the dark long enough, you do start literally seeing things. <laughs> some may be real, some may not be. Uh, but anyway, you just got to go out and look. That's all you got to do. Uh, I do use a red light uh, just for safety just to move around when I need to. You don't want the red light to look for them because you don't you don't need that, uh, but just for safety reasons so that you can uh, see how you're moving around. And I also actually wear, I wear tall rubber boots so I don't need to worry about stepping on a copperhead when I'm out there too, because most of the time I'm out there in total darkness. Now the red light, you know, will light up the area so you can safely see it. 
but you don't want to go out there and just keep red light on all the time because again you may not see them and we don't know what effect the red light has on their behavior too so when i go out i just and this is this is the top of my hill behind my house this is a time lapse of me just briefly turning on my red light checking something out as i'm moving around looking for the ghost firefly so again just use that uh, very judiciously now if you go out and you're expecting to see this nah you're not going to see this i did this with a laser pointer out in the woods again they're much of uh, more subtly subtle in their brightness so you're not going to see this and if you see this in your woods at night your woods are indeed haunted get out of those woods as soon as you can because you, you you have other issues other than the ghost fireflies now when you are out there remember these females are living in the ground uh, adult females and that's their, that's that's where they've been living uh, that's where they're going to lay their eggs and guard their eggs until they hatch or till they die uh, tread lightly in other words you don't you don't be stomping out there with a heavy foot uh, if you if you do see some in an area, you know, you sort of go around the area. Don't just go barreling through there. And remember that as you walk in these areas, even you may be stepping on some that are not even lit, because once they they mate, again, she's going to be guarding her eggs until she passes away. So again, you want to tread light, but just just be aware of that. And that's why some places like Dupont State Forest and other places they actually put limitations on where you can go during the blue ghost mating season. So just be aware of that. We don't want to destroy what we're looking for. Uh, now, as far as documenting goes, we, we obviously want to know where, you know, that's one of the key things, but also things about when you see them and the weather when you see them, how many you see, you know, males versus females. And again, the, the light spots on the on the abdomen of the, of the females, you know, use a hand lens so you can get down, all right, how many light spots do I really see uh, on these critters? Now we make it easy for you. We have a, Chris Goforth developed a website for the Carolina Ghost Hunt, and you can do this online and go online and enter your information and what you observed. And we want you to do that. Uh, you can take notes and just email it to us. But please, if you do go out and observe, let us know so that we can so that we can use your information to help map out where these are, and they may give us some new directions on where to continue to look or which direction to look. So. So please do that. And again, this is showing just the, the two uh, light organs of the female, which you know uh, just helps us separate this species from some others that we would like to verify. Now, what if you go out and look and you don't see any ghost fireflies? Well, go look again. <laughs> Maybe it's the wrong night. So, so don't give up just on one night of looking in an area. Uh, at least give it, you know, uh, several nights over a couple of weeks period before you rule out that they're there or whatever. Uh, but we're really hoping you'll get out uh, now is we're right in the middle of the peak is we think go out now, go out now if you can this week, next week and look, we hope that you'll see a ghost firefly. We hope that you'll see a lot of ghost fireflies, but just go out and look. Thank you so much uh, for listening. And we do have time for some questions. And uh, Chris did a, a website for us. So you can find out a lot more information about the Carolina Ghost Hunt and how you can help us map out and learn more about this really cool critter. So that is my, my ghost story. So thank you so much. Everybody, let's give all three of our guests today a great big round of applause, wherever you happen to be. I'm sure they'll hear it <laughs> all the way out, all the way across <laughs> around the world where we're uh, zooming in from today. Right. Uh, but really exciting stuff. I am, I'm going to have to get out tonight and see if I can find some of these. Awesome. Well, first, I'm going to have to find a good patch of woods, I guess. Should I expect to see something like this just like in a yard or or a park maybe? Like, could I look for them when I'm just walking my dog? You can, if you walk in the right place. Uh, uh, a park with woods obviously would be better than a grassy, like a like greenway, but I wouldn't rule anything out. 
Uh, but remember, of course, some parks may not be accessible at night. So keep keep that in mind too. Don't you don't want to be arrested <laughs> for trespassing at night? But yet, yeah, I think any place is fair fair game if it's again has that mixed woods. Yeah, we we'd encourage you to look in any kind of woods actually, um, because we're not we're not sure exactly where we might expect to find them. Um, all of the the uh, Piedmont ghost sites that we've uh, had success in so far are kind of upland, um, drier woods, um, but that doesn't mean that they might not be in other kinds of habitats. The blue ghosts in the mountains, the reticulata, they tend to be in moisture woods down closer to the creeks. Um, so that's another difference between these two forms that suggests to us that they're different species. But we'd encourage you to look in any kind of any kind of woods. Um, bear in mind that they can't disperse very far. They can only disperse as far as those little females can crawl. And so um, if woods have been disturbed extensively within the last several years, they're probably not going to be there. But uh, if you've got, you know, somewhat mature woods, uh, it's certainly worth looking. And we really, really want to know what's going on in the geographic area beyond where we already know uh, we have these things. Excellent stuff. Uh, we had a couple of comments come in during the presentation too. Uh, Hannah wrote that they observed fireflies in Lenore County two weeks ago on wooded property, uh, but they're going to have to go back and verify the species. So, yeah, so uh, there are other fireflies active right now. <clears throat> in fact, probably the first firefly that most folks see is actually one that Chris had a picture of, and that's Pyrectomina borealis. So it's an early spring fire, firefly, but that's one of the, the ones that flashes. Um, and so we'll, we'll, uh, we're interested in any firefly information, but we're really interested in information about these ghost fireflies. So we'd encourage you, yeah, if she has seen them, to go back out and, you know, let us know what it was she saw. Excellent stuff. And then Julie writes, I think I found one in Shank Forest Friday night, the larva form female with two spots. Just as I shined a light on it, a wolf spider grabbed it. <laughs> yep. So we're going to have to go check that one out again. And, and nature I'm of nature right there. <laughs> And I, I know John Connors actually searched Shank Forest last night too. He said he didn't find any. So that's that we, we want to hear more about that report for sure. Yeah. So yeah, one of the one of the things that's that's complicating all this for us is that it, I think we think our, our Piedmont ghosts and the inexensa that we talked about are very closely related. And uh, the females may not be distinguishable. So who knows what we've got, but the more observers we have, the more observations we gather, the more we're going to know. But yeah, Shank Forest should be good habitat, at least parts of it. Will's asking uh, what kind of conservation efforts this could lead to. So again, um, you know, fireflies are, in a, in a lot of respects, they're kind of like the canaries in a coal mine uh, for us because they require quality habitat. And if they're disappearing, that means that bad things are happening to the habitats that they inhabit. And those firefly species like the ghosts that have these larva form females are particularly sensitive to environmental disturbance because once they get this, this, uh, displaced, they have a, it takes a very long time for them to recolonize. Again, you know, this little thing that's only the size of a rice grain can only crawl so far over the course of her lifetime, and that's how far they can redisperse. Uh, so um, we're hoping down the road, as we learn more about these fireflies, that we can have them function something like uh, a canary in a coal mine forest in terms of helping us monitor environmental quality. Um, well, we want to conserve them, that's for sure. And the best way to do that is, you know, preserving woods. Chris, I know you spend time out at the museum's Prairie Ridge Eco Station. Uh, any sightings out there on the museum's nature preserve? I have not seen them yet, um, but I am planning to go this year to see if we can find them, especially if they've been seen at Shank. We should be able to see them at Prairie Ridge. Well, 
are likely to see them at Prairie Ridge. Um, we, we see a lot of other species there. Um, we usually really kind of focus our firefly observations a little bit later in the year. So we'll shift them a little bit earlier this year. Right, this might be a good, re if there's people to do it, I guess, but it'd be interesting to know. Are we harboring undescribed species out at Prairie Ridge? <laughs> Almost certainly. <laughs> Almost certainly, and probably of more than even just fireflies, which which really as, uh, as we get into like the last minute here, like this is super exciting that that there's quite possibly uh, this species of animal, right, that lives so close to all of us, but it's not been like formally documented and written about, even though, you know, maybe folks like John Connors, <laughs> who used to work here with the museum as an expert naturalist might have known about it for a long time, this process of documenting the range and their habits really gets, uh, helps us to uh, conserve them or uh, to conduct more research on them. So it's like, a, it's a really special thing that folks can get out and participate in. Absolutely. And then, you know, it, it does, it does point to the fact that there are still lots and lots of things to learn uh, about the natural world, even in a place as um, well studied as North Carolina, um, there are still mysteries out there to solve. Absolutely. And it is, of course, hard to conserve things that you don't know anything about. <laughs> you have Absolutely. to know something about their behaviors and their habits and their, their habitat requirements to be able to keep them around. So that's what we're hoping to do. Excellent. Uh, hit me with that website one more time so the folks can check it out to learn more. Uh, or submit observations. CarolinaGhostHunt.org. There you have it, everybody. Chris, Jerry, Clyde, thanks for being on the program today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Real, real, really good group. Very, very spirited audience today. <laughs> Jerry, Jerry, Jerry. That's a good one. I appreciate it. We couldn't get out of here without one of those. I know. Sorry. <laughs> that, that was a great one. Uh, hey, everybody, we'll be back here again next Wednesday at noon with another edition of the Lunchtime Discovery Series. Make sure they check, that you check out naturalsciences.org to see the schedule of upcoming presentations. You can also visit the Office of Environmental Education online at their website, eenorthcarolina.org. And of course, we're all on social media. So you can give it a Google or check out the websites. We're at Natural Sciences on social media. And the Office of Environmental Education is North Carolina EE on social media. Until next time, everybody, uh, take care, stay safe, and happy ghost hunting. We'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. <laughs>